Leslie James McNair was born in Minnesota, the son of Scotch immigrants. He was graduated from West Point in 1904, served with the AEF in 1917, and was made Commander Army Ground Forces in 1942, wounded in action 1943, killed in action 1944. General George Marshall said of him, the American Army has sustained a great loss in the death of General McNair. Had he had the choice, he would probably have elected to die as he did. His presence on the firing line should be an inspiring example to the forces of our great ground army, which he organized and trained. We salute Lieutenant General McNair. Normandy are quiet now. The battle's moved on. No bullets, no buildings burning like torches. No Germans left. Only the memory of them all. Down there in the rubble, a Yank is leaving town, moving on with the rest of the war. Normandy is his. The cities are quiet. But they weren't before he got there. Before headquarters called for a serenade by every available piece of artillery within range. Yes, the man's much wiser, if not so much older. He's learned how to handle his equipment a lot easier. And he knows the value of friendly planes as they roar over his head, blistering the German reinforcements before they could get started, quarantining the Cherbourg Peninsula. in a tight rope. This man, not long away from the streets of home, now is learning intimately the streets of Cherbourg. He called the sniper's bullets incoming mail. There was some outgoing mail, too. another thing. He's learned who the enemy was. A year or so ago, the enemy was a vague word in a military pamphlet. enemy wasn't vague any longer. He was as real as the freshly dug graves of this soldier's friends. 
Yes, like the Russians whose homes had been meaninglessly pillaged, like the English whose homes even at the moment were being blasted by robot bombs, like the Chinese, like his allies, the Yank knew his enemies. The American soldier had taken Normandy, but he knew it was only part of his job. enemies were many and not just here in a corner of France. He knew he had to move on to meet them wherever they were. And he was on his way. This is a painting of an Iowa farmer and his wife. It was painted by an Iowa man named Grant Wood. Maybe his tongue was in his cheek a little, but there's a feel of Iowa to it. A taste of the land. Iowa is a lot of things and a lot of towns and people. But from one town to the next, the flat black Iowa earth reaches out fertile and rich, and towns sit in between. Oskaloosa, Iowa, out where the tall corn grows. Going on three years, the modern towns scattered across the prairie tableland between the Mississippi and Missouri have been at war, and they're changed some. We took these pictures at dawn one morning when the only folks up were the swing ships homebound from a war plant somewhere. It was only a quarter to five. The papers were out with the war news, but the sun wasn't up yet. The town wasn't either. few hours, the streets down there would fill up. Iowa women would be at the counters of the stores with their ration books, and farmers would be arriving to buy chicken feed or fence wire, if they could get it. The night watchman would be sleeping through another day of war. But he still had another hour at a quarter to five. It was still early at sunup. In town, early. Out on the land, not early. Work is different on the land. The people who work the land are different since the war. Forget to set the alarm, son? Oh, I guess so, Pa. Well, get up. You're late. The kid's name is Scott Ellis, same as his father's. He's been 13 since April. But since a year ago, last September, he's been hired hand, school kid, and assistant farmer to his pup. The farm's not small, and 44 has been a tough year in Iowa. Rains in April were heavy. May was worse. The ground's been too soft for the plow, and rain clouds have cheated Iowa crops of sunlight. Wheat slate and corn slate pretty near everywhere in Iowa. It's been tough for Scott, with his oldest boy hurrying off into the Navy the day he hit 18. And it's been tough for him to keep Scott Jr. going off to school every day with so much help needed and no place to find it except when neighbors pitch in. Farm days start earlier and end later these days. Overslept, eh? Son. Thank you for the blessing of God, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Son, eat your breakfast. Oh, I can't, Pop. We'll be late for school. Yeah. These 
used to be in Iowa saying about hogs, about feeding the hogs to make pork for your kids so your kids come up healthy enough to grow corn to feed the hogs. Only in 1944, one out of every four hogs Scott Ellis sells goes to war as pork or ham or <laughs> spam. And in 1944, almost twice as many little piglets have been born and fattened up and sold than ever before on the Ellis farm, hired help or no. Iowa as a state has turned out a million more pigs this year than four years ago. Iowa farmers are producing from 10 to 100 percent more of everything. With the whole world needing terribly every quart of milk and bushel of wheat and pound of stock their hands produce. Of course, Iowa's always led the states in poultry. But this year, she's up 14 million in brooder hens and 19 million in chickens. Ask Mrs. Ellis. She's upped her quota from about 750 to almost 1,200. Nowadays, except for cleaning the hen house, the chickens are her department, along with housekeeping and cooking and keeping her men folks in line and out in the fields on time. boys, you've seen a little bit of what goes on around our farms early in the morning. Everybody has his job, no shirking. You see, we work just like a team, same as you fellas do. And that goes for my neighbor folks, as well as for our own folks. We're planting corn now, a month late. The rains have held us back, the ground's been too soft for a plow. Next month, we're going to start planting the Southwest 40 to soybeans. Research is finding more and more uses for these beans. They claim they can use all the beans that we can produce this year. They claim you fellas use a lot of them in your munitions, and maybe they're feeding them to you for peanuts. I don't know. I suppose you fellas noticed my daughter this morning at breakfast. Farmer's daughter, you know. Well. She's not only a farmer's daughter, she's son to me now. My oldest boy's in the South Pacific. There's Bev now, gone for next week's planting. Thousands of young folks helping us out these days because of the critical labor shortages. If they're not plowing in the fields, they're doing all sorts of farm chores. <coughs> Bye, son. Now there's your story of Iowa, boys. That's a story of Iowa, Scott. It's a little story inside a bigger story, because there's washing machine plants and button factories and slaughterhouses in that big state of yours sitting out there beside the Mississippi. Just as much Iowa as the black earth rolling sidewise under the power harrows and the plows. The plants are subcontracting for ordnance now, and they've cut army airfields into the prairies, and they've scattered army posts and navy stations around the state, and they've sent 160,000 Iowans off to war. But the drone of tractors cutting back the Iowa soil for seed at 5 a.m. is what's most of Iowa. Scott Ellis and his neighbor folk are what's most of Iowa, as they cut the long, straight furrows for their corn. The story of Scott Ellis is a little story, but his two million neighbor folk in their rich earth are big enough to help us win this war. Thank you. 
doesn't live here anymore.